All right, thanks everyone for joining for today's webinar. Jenkins X continues delivery for Kubernetes. Before we start, I want to let everyone know a few things. One, you can ask questions. We will have time at the end. As soon as you think of a question, even if maybe we might get to the answer during a presentation, please ask it. So it's good to know what people are really interested in hearing about, and we'll be able to reiterate on everything at the end. Uh, two, we are recording this. So if for any reason you need to drop, or you maybe you have a colleague who's unable to join, there will be a recording sent out very soon after this. Uh, on top of that, there's a short survey when I end the webinar later on. Just a quick little, what would you like to know more about it in future sessions? Uh, so if anyone still on at the end could answer that, we'd really appreciate it. It helps us know what kind of webinars to put on. And also there's a lot of sessions like these every year at DevOps World Jenkins World. Carlos himself has spoken at several of these. So I'm gonna be putting a code as well as a link for where to go to register into the chat once we get started. That will get you 20% off your registration at either location. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much more time at the beginning. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Carlos Sanchez. He's the author of the Kubernetes plugin for Jenkins, and he works with me here at CloudBees. So Carlos, why don't you get us started? Thank you, Max. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, continuous delivery with Jenkins X. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a demo of what you can do today with Jenkins X, um, a very, I think, vi visual example. And then I'm going to also talk about the second half or so about something new we are working on, which is uh, progressive delivery um, and canary deployments with Jenkins X. And I'll show you how easy you can you can enable this feature. So with that, let's start. I have uh, this application called Croc Hunter. Uh, this is a GitHub repository with a Golang application. And I have something that will be very common. I have a staging and a production environment. That's everything that uh, Jenkins X gives me uh, out of the box. So I have... Uh, this version uh, deployed to staging and I can see my application. It's a very, very interesting game. Just shooting lasers to crocodiles. Could, what could be more fun than that? And I have that here and it's uh, release 00130 and I can see the commit ID and what his name is this running on. This is all running on Kubernetes and everything you're going to see today is running on Kubernetes. And I have the same version, same release of the application on my production environment. So same thing here, just running in a different host. Uh, well, this is the Kubernetes pod host name. And same release, same commit ID. So what I want to do now is uh, show you the typical development flow. Uh, that any developer could do today with uh, uh, like GitHub. So I'm going to make a change here. Uh, let's say, uh, well, show, throwing lasers to crocodiles is not very environmentally friendly. So let's make a small change to my application. I just need to change this here. Let's create a new branch and let's call it no lasers. No lasers. And I'm gonna submit this as a pull request on GitHub. I could have done this from the from any my favorite IDE or editor or whatever. Um, so you can see here that now there is this serverless Jenkins um, check that is uh, uh, waiting for my, oops, something happened here. Uh, let's see, I'm in the right place. Okay. Well, let's take a look at the at the logs in a second. So, if this doesn't work, 
So I have my two checks. One is the serverless Jenkins. This is doing the build of my application. And it's called serverless Jenkins because it, this is using uh, what a new project, a recent project on Jenkins that is uh, running serverless uh, Jenkins build. So there's no Jenkins master running all the time. It's just being started for a build, then it runs the build, and then it gets uh, destroyed. And uh, there's another uh, check that is doing type that is waiting for a proof, uh, for me to approve this pull request. So if I go to my Kubernetes cluster, I can see the logs of uh, that pull request build. I can scroll up a little bit. So this is what's starting. You see here all the pipeline logs. So it's doing running a make file. It's doing a Docker build. And this is all happening in Kubernetes, as I said before. Uh, this is a pull request, and it's building this version. And it's doing everything there, and it finished with success. So uh, let's go back to my pull request. OK, here it is. My bot has commented. JenkinsX provides you this bot that will comment on pull request and help you follow this uh, what we call a GitOps process. So GitOps is a methodology, let's say, where all your changes and everything happens through Git. So the source of truth is Git. And I'll show you in a sec second what that means for deployments. But I can interactuate with this bot. This bot is basically telling me this pull request is not approved. And it has added the size, uh, extra small, it's a very small change. And it's telling me something very interesting, like in the last 31 seconds, it's like the, my pull request is available in this preview environment here. So I can click here, and I can see uh, the pull request that has been built. So it's a snapshot, pull request 44, the commit ID, this is this matches this matches the call, the commit ID of the pull request. And if I play, I can see that my changes are in. So instead of throwing lasers to crocodiles, now I'm throwing fish. Okay, so I can see my changes, and I could be playing this for, for hours, but I can see my changes in a preview environment before this gets to anybody, not even in staging or of course not production. So I can see my application here is deployed in this preview environment, and I can say, OK, this looks good. So I can interact with my bot. I can do very useful things like meow. And this bot has uh, a number of plugins. So one of them is every time you uh, do meow, then you get a picture of a cat and something a bit more useful uh, that I can do is to say slash approve. And in a second, this last check that is missing here is going to uh, show that uh, the pull request is approved, and then it will automatically merge. I don't have to do anything else for this pull request to be, to be merged. Once that happens, I can show you um, my environment. So, here it is. This is my staging environment. Uh, a staging environment is a Git repository. Production environment is a different Git repository. And this Git repository basically saying what applications are being deployed to each environment and in which versions. So um, 
the one I had here before in the staging was was, was it 00130. And we see that matches with what is in the Git repository. So when my pull request that is merged into master, which I think it's just happened, there it is. So the bot has automatically marked it as approved and merged the commit into master. I can delete the branch now. What's going to happen is going to build master and it's going to deploy that automatically to my staging environment. So if I go to pull request in my staging environment, I can see that my bot has opened a pull request here that is basically promoting uh, the Croc Hunter application to version 00131, which is the next version that I had in a staging. If I look at the files changed, I can see that 130 to 131 and this has automatically been merged. I mean, it was built, uh, everything went uh, fine, and this was automatically merged. I didn't have to do anything. So now I can close my pull request environment. I can go to staging, refresh. I still have 00130. It may take a little bit more. Um, but what has happened um, is that this 131 change in my staging environment is now merged into master and this is going to trigger a deployment into my staging environment so my cluster always looks like what is defined on git and that's the tenant of GitOps. git git is the source of truth so let's see in one second there it is so I have released 00131, and that's uh, the version I, uh, the pull, includes the pull request I made. So this has all happened uh, without me doing anything, just opening the pull request, approving it, and everything else happened automatically. So that's one of the, of the main goals behind Jenkins X, automate all these uh, tedious tasks. And also having these GitOps uh, definitions that help me uh, avoid deviations or avoid inconsistencies between what I think should be deployed and what it actually is. So if I go to the command line, I'm telling here some logs so you can see um, the first log here, the, the, the first was the pull request build, and after that it succeeded here somewhere, and then that was merged into master, and I can see the logs of the master build happening, 00131, that succeeded. That's the build of the Docker image, and that succeeded here somewhere. Um, somewhere over here. And then uh, it has created a pull request for my staging repository. So all these things happen in my Kubernetes cluster in different pods and containers. So let me go back, step back and show you uh, or talk a, a bit of about what Jenkins X is, right? So this is what you saw is what you can do with Jenkins X, how this works behind the scenes. Uh, is Jenkins X installs in your Kubernetes cluster, installs Docker, installs uh, different tools like a scaffold, draft on Helm. So a scaffold is a tool from Google that allows you to build Docker images in different environments. Draft is from Microsoft. Uh, it generates Docker files and Helm charts when for your applications when you, know, when you don't have them. So if you want to import one of your existing projects Jenkins X, into Jenkins X, it will execute Draft 
and it will generate all these Docker file and Helm charts because Helm is one of the main components here. Everything we deployed on Kubernetes is a Helm chart. Helm is like the packager for Kubernetes applications. So it includes all these definitions for Kubernetes, what image to run, um, what services to expose, what uh, environment variables, all that. Uh, those are the Kubernetes definitions, and then it gets packaged as a Helm repository. It uses Chart Museum. Chart Museum is a Helm web server that uh, holds this Helm, so you can see as a, as a repository for Helm packages. It also includes Nexus, that is used for caching of the artifacts, because every time we do a build, is running in a new container. So it's very important to cache in the local network all the files that get unloaded, like all your Maven dependencies or um, other types of dependencies from NPM packages or anything like that. It's important that uh, it's all local. Uh, so otherwise, every build will be downloading it from the internet. It includes Knative build. Um, Knative build is a new project from Google that uh, basically we are using for launching these serverless Jenkins every time there is a new build or a new event from GitHub. So every time there's a new event from GitHub, the event gets captured and a new pod is created. That pod gets the source code and then a Jenkins uh, instance uh, that is very small and just starts in a few seconds, runs on that source code, processes that Jenkins file, and that's whatever it's uh, defined in there. And in order to do that, uh, we use something from the Kubernetes project called uh, Prow. And it's, uh, it includes a chatbot that you saw that I, I talked to on the pull requests. It includes the event handling from our GitHub uh, webhooks and, and a few other components. And of course, it includes uh, Jenkins. It includes uh, Jenkins. You can choose whether you want to use it serverless or traditional. So in traditional, you get your own Jenkins master with its UI and the Jenkins you are used to. Um, it's just that in this demo and what I'm showing today, I'm using Jenkins serverless for everything. Jenkins serverless has the advantage of scaling a lot more because you get a new Jenkins for each build. Uh, it's, a, it's a specific type of Jenkins. It's actually the Jenkins file runner project that just processes your Jenkins file. So it just takes a few seconds to start but you don't need to run it uh, all the time. So if you have very small builds, very small number of builds, you can use the serverless and then you don't pay for running uh, Jenkins master all the time. And if you have a large number of builds also, you benefit because it will scale and uh, you pay per use. Basically, that's the, the idea behind, behind serverless. So I have... Yeah, this serverless Jenkins uh, translates to launching one Kubernetes pod per job that does this git checkout and execution of the Jenkins file, and then it just uh, kills the container. And there's the two projects using Jenkins Knative and Jenkins file run. Uh, so this, this is all running on, this example in particular is running on Google Container Engine. Uh, sorry, Google Kubernetes Engine now. And so I have a cluster that only has two nodes, uh, 30 gigs of RAM, so uh, Kubernetes 111. And this has auto scaling enabled. So if I have multiple Git, uh, webhooks uh, happening, multiple pull requests, multiple builds happening, this will give me auto scaling. So it will go up and down when those builds uh, end, uh, the nodes will also shrink. So it's not only going up, but also going down. And the added benefit, 
uh, here I can see, so I can get all the logs for this cluster for this Jenkins serverless build steps. So I can come here and see the logs if I wanted to. Everything you saw in the command line, so I don't I don't need to really use the command line, but I can use uh, stack driver logging to see the logs and I can use their APIs to, to see it if I wanted to. So everything I showed in the command line is also here. So uh, the different tests running, the Docker build of the images, all that stuff. So let me show you, okay, one thing where uh, building up CloudBees, which is this, uh, user interface and with within here i can see my different teams that i have uh, i can see the applications i have running this cross hunter jenkins x i can see what version is in the staging what version is in production and when i click on any of these versions i can get details um what's the build number when did it happen what version uh what Bots did the build. I could also see issues and commits uh, if I have this link. But I can see this graphical, I have this graphical view of, of the of what's happening in my Jenkins X cluster. So that's the main cycle. Um, so this is the staging environment. I show GitOps and what else can I do with Jenkins X? So there's some other interesting features other than the mm -hmm. code to deploy. Um, so one of them is uh, DevPod. So if I go and say, go uh, DX create DevPod, and I'm gonna reuse if it exists, and I'm gonna sync my contents, so this will ask me um, what type of dev pod I want to create. And it will basically start a container, a pod in my Kubernetes cluster is going to uh, start this container with uh, one of the templates I have, uh, I could choose from here. So I chose uh, the gold template. So I probably have to go install. <laughs> and I basically have a development environment in my Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. I have uh, my local directory synced to the remote, uh, to the cloud uh, container. So if I go here in create a test file, there it is. If I go to my container, I can that test file uh, has been created too. So a dev pod allows me to use the cloud for development. I can edit the files locally and they will get synced remotely. And I can do uh, make, for instance, and all this is going to happen a lot faster than in my laptop because everything that needs to be downloaded, it will be downloaded from the internet through and, and from the cloud internet and not my connection. I can do Docker builds really fast because it's also using these uh, more powerful machines in the cloud, and it's all synced with my with my local uh, repository with my local directory in my laptop. So there it is. I'm going to exit. Um, what else I can show you? Let me switch to another cluster and I'm going to I'm gonna show you how to create a new project. You can create a new project from a quick start, 
or importing existing one. So I can create a quick start. Uh, let's call it favoriting. Oh, well, it's 28, doesn't matter. Um, I can choose, so I have multiple templates to choose from. I'm gonna do now a project with node. If this is going to initialize my Git repository. It's going to create a GitHub repository for it. It's going to uh, create Docker files. It's going to create Helm charts for it. And there is. It's going to create the repository in GitHub. So here. And this is. Uh, a new project using Node, and it comes with the scaffold file, as you see, the Docker file, the charts that for Helm, everything is pre-built and pre-packaged for me, and I can start doing all these, um, uh, all the flow that I show you with the Croc Hunter application, I can do it with a new application. So this is the ideal way to get the start. You can also do a JX import and uh, bring in one of your existing projects. It's gonna get analyzed and it's going to generate also the Docker file and the Helm charts and, and everything. I didn't mention, uh, let me go back to my other cluster. Mm. I didn't mention it, uh, but you can run Jenkins sex in not only in, in Google Kubernetes Engine, but you can run it in the main cloud providers, Azure, AWS, Google, um, even Oracle, I think IBM too and also OpenShift and Minikube if you want to run it locally. So that's all the stuff you can do. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I did the quick starts, the dev bots, and I'm gonna jump now into something we are working on right now. So it's not final what you're gonna see, but it will give you an idea on how to do progressive delivery. So progressive delivery uh, definition is, uh, is this next step after continuous delivery, right? Where new versions are deployed to a subset of users. So think about canary. Uh, you only deploy for, to a percentage of users, the new versions, and then you check if that deployment is correct and performs well before rolling that new version to all the users uh, of your application. And if these metrics fail, you roll it back. So Canary is probably the main uh, or the most popular uh, idea in progressive delivery. You can also uh, think of uh, blue green where you have two deployments and then you switch traffic to one or another. Um, so you have your blue um, deployment with existing version, you have a green deployment with the new version. If something breaks when you use the green uh, new version, you just flip a switch or change the DNS name or something really easy and send everybody back to the blue um, environment. Canary is more ad advanced in the sense that it allows you to do percentage base and with the tools we have today, you can also do uh, analyze the request and maybe send uh, some users from some specific geographical region to, to your new version. And what I'm gonna show you is how to do Canary uh, very easily sending a percentage of users to the new application and checking if, if that's uh, correct. 
before rolling it out to, to all the rest of the users. In Jenkins X, you can use this today. Uh, you just need to install Istio, Prometheus, and Flagger. Flagger is the Kubernetes uh, tool that will enable these canary deployments. Istio is a service mesh that is going to um, gather data from your application, so you don't have to touch your application for anything. And Prometheus is a metric server. All this data from Istio is going to end in Prometheus, and then its flagger is going to check that data to, to do a canary analysis. So you can do that in your Kubernetes and your Jenkins X cluster, and then you will have uh, all these bits installed to, to enable Canary. So Istio is a, it's a very big project, let's say. Um, it allows you to do a lot of things. What we're going to focus today is on the uh, control or of the traffic and also on the observation and the metrics. So it still allows you to um, basically using the service mesh proxy all the requests for between your services in your cluster. And with that, what you can do is one, send some requests to one service or another. In our case, we're going to send some uh, of those requests to the new version of the, of the service and the rest to the old version. And it also, uh, proxying all these requests, it will uh, store metrics and metrics to Prometheus. And we are going to look at two metrics. We're going to look at response uh, time and we're going to look at uh, um, response codes. So with just those two metrics that Istio gives us uh, for free without doing anything to our application, we can enable Canary uh, in a totally automated way. And Flagger is the other uh, application that automates the, the promotion of Canary deployments using Istio and Prometheus, as I mentioned before. So it basically is the one that controls the rollout. One thing you would need to do first, uh, because we're going to use Istio instead of the normal uh, ingress controller of Kubernetes, we're going to use the Istio ingress. So we need to get this IP. I already did that and set up a domain pointing to, to this IP. And so uh, let's see. I have it here. This is my Istio. Uh, my Istio entry point in my cluster. And I see that my release is 00130, which is the first version that I show you today. So that's the, the laser one. Let's go back. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to add today, and we're going to uh, make this a lot easier for when you do a quick start. Um, you just need a canary object in Kubernetes that will, in your application, that will um, basically define what kind of rollout you want to do. So if I go to my application here, it's going to be easier to see it here. Charts, counter, templates, canary. So this is a Helm template where I can set some, uh, well, this is a template and then I can set some values that will fill this template. There are, those values are here in my values.yaml. So I can enable my can a canary. I set the host name that is going to uh, accept this uh, incoming traffic. This is the Jenkins X gateway that is created by Jenkins X. And then the canary analysis, I want to analyze traffic for 60, every 60 seconds 
and I want to do 10% increase uh, steps, 10 percent steps and go up to 50% before rolling out to everybody. So let's uh, try it first. And while it uh, rolls out, I can explain the details. So with Jenkins X, you can get the application running and the way you, uh, so I can see I have a staging 0, 0, 31, 131 and production is 130. So what you would do is, uh, what you would do in Jenkins X is uh, in order to get 131 to production is just say the X promote. Uh, Jenkins X, that's the version. That's the environment production. So what this is going to do, this is going to create a pull request in my production GitHub repository, changing the version from 00130 to 00131. Uh, there it is. So the same thing we saw in the staging, but done in production. And I have the logs of Flagger tail here. In any second, uh, things are going to start to show up there. So what uh, Jenkins, well, Jenkins X is doing, it's building this pull request in my production environment and deploying the 00131 version to production. So it's going to take a second, there it is, something happening. And then Flagger is going to take over and is going to say, oh, you want to uh, upgrade to 131. What I'm going to do is I'm going to update to 131 only at 10% of the traffic. And I have uh, here, a call that is basically uh, every second hitting my URL and showing me the response code that is 200 and the version that is deployed. So this is 130 still. Okay. Okay. This has done something. It just takes a second for everything to kick out. I can see what's in my production environment. Okay, it's my shortcut for kubectl uh, and the X production get all. Flagger does create several new objects. Okay, this is something is happening. Um, so now I have a canary service, a primary service, um, a primary deployment, and I have two pods running, one with the old version and one with the new version. And we see here in the flagger logs, new revision detected, scaling up, scaling up. Uh, let me see. Scaling up uh, Croc Hunter. So, starting canary analysis. Let me increase the font a little bit. And advancing uh, production canary weight is 10% now. So, in any time, we would see here that instead of 130, here it is some requests are returning 131 and this should be 10 percent of the request approximately so there's another one if i go to my uh, web application say if i refresh enough times i get one 131 if i refresh again i get 130 so 10 percent of my traffic is going to the new version 
Flagger also comes with a Grafana uh, dashboard where I can see the uh, incoming version and the canner, um, sorry, the existing version and the canary version. So you can see that there was enough traffic for the canary. And now I can see what's the incoming vo request volume and success rate for the canary. And this is uh, starting now to get traffic. So by default, what I have here, uh, well, what I have configured here is that 10% every one minute up to 50%. I want to make sure that the uh, non-500 responses are 99%, so only accept 1% of failures in 60 seconds. And the duration of the request uh, of the person till 99 is 500 milliseconds. So these two metrics are being checked by Flagger to do the rollout. So this is happening. Now, if we go back to the Flagger logs. I get more requests getting returning 131 because Flagger is now 10, 20, and 30%. So right now, 30% of the traffic is uh, is going to the um, to the canary. But the other cool thing that I can do here, if I'm quick enough, I can show you what would happen if there's a failure in the um, in the rollout. So let me run this script. Uh, if I find out where. I'm going to go into a dev pod. The existing one. And I'm going to make sure I'm going to force this. My application has this uh, API that I can force 500 requests. So this is to fake 500 errors. And if I go again to Grafana, I can see now I'm forcing 500 errors. And the other thing I can do is force uh, delays to increase the res uh, response time. But I can see that my request success rate of my canary is dropping to 80%. So what I told Flagger is, I, uh, if um, less than 99% of the requests succeed, then uh, roll back automatically the deploy. So that's what Flagger is doing. It's doing, is deciding here, I'm gonna halt the deployment because the success rate of the request is only 57%, not 99 that you requested. So I can see the, the canary success rate just dropping drastically here. I can see other data like the CPU usage, memory usage, networking, and all other stuff. But now I'm faking the, the success uh, the failures, actually. And if I go back uh, here to the logs, it, it, it is halting the, the rollout. So in a second, this, what Flagger is going to do, is going to say, I'm going to give up on version 131, and I'm going to leave production in version 130. So you don't have to do anything at all. And this is going to safeguard your production deployment and ensure that it fit, it matches the, the uh, metrics that you, that you want 
So this will be a, like a safe deployment because if something breaks, it's gonna get automatically rolled out, rolled back. And this is gonna happen in any anytime soon. I can also get here. Let's see. I can get uh, in JX production, get the canary object. This is like any other uh, Kubernetes object. I can see the scribe. I can see the weight that is doing. Now it's uh, progressing the deployment, the rollout, and the current weight is 40%. I can describe it. I can see in the events what's happening. It went from 10 to 20, 30, 40, and then it, uh, it's halting the, the advancement because the request uh, success is dropping. Okay, still there, halting it. And at some point is going to, to do the rollback. So while well, that happens, let me go back here. I showed you this on GitHub. And yeah, you just need to run your usual J Jenkins X promote uh, command line to promote to production and with the added benefit of canary rollout. How this works behind the scenes is that Flagger is using uh, Istio virtual services and configuring them to send traffic to the primary or the canary deployments. So, and Flagger is also creating this canary deployment and is using the data from Prometheus and is talking to the Kubernetes API and is basically telling Istio go 10% more and 10% more, 10% more, more or uh, roll it back. And so in the different steps, first you would have everything on one version and then you would then send in a percentage to the second version two, up to 50% and this is configurable. And at some point, everything goes to version two and then the two deployments, the primary and the canary gets, get folded into, into one. This is the graph and more I show you. It also has a Slack integration uh, if you want to, to get these messages into, into your Slack room. So this is the uh, application that I show you, the Croc Hunter, where it has all these examples and some docs on how to enable Flagger um, and uh, Jenkins X and the canaries. Uh, let's see if this has finally, okay, there it is. Uh, it got to a point where it failed. Uh, I th that's configure also. It failed three times, five times. So it's now saying, well, I'm rolling it back because uh, threshold reached five, so five errors, I'm rolling it back. And the canary failed and it's scaling down the canary deployment. So if I go here and describe it, I get the same messages so the canary failed and running it back and if i go to grafana i can see that no new no traffic is being sent to the canary anymore so we were we got more and more traffic and then uh, it stopped getting traffic uh, because there, it was rolled back Okay, so that's uh, all I had for me. And um, let's open the mic for questions, Max. Yes, uh, thanks for the presentation, Carlos. We got a lot of questions in, so we're gonna go through what we have time for. Just as a quick reminder to everyone, once we're done with the questions and I close the webinar, we have a very short survey to know what you'd like to learn more about in the future. Uh, we also have more questions coming in. Please don't be afraid to continue asking as you, think of anything else so there is one question carlos that i know you're you're anticipating and a few people ask in different ways so i'm going to kind of combine a few of this a few of these 
Um, is the Jenkins UX, excuse me, is the Jenkins X UI also serverless? Uh, is it also just deployed to the Kubernetes cluster and does it persist across executions? So Jenkins X, um, you have two modes of installation, the serverless Jenkins and the traditional. With the traditional, you get your normal Jenkins UI, the one you're familiar with. With the serverless, you get no UI at all. You would uh, you can check the logs using, using the Kubernetes APIs and using like a show like a stock driver logs or anything like that. What CloudBees has built is uh, this CloudBees core UI um, that it's uh, going to be part of our products. That the one I show you uh, where you can see what versions and uh, and that basically feeds data from you know, Kubernetes APIs and some uh, persistent database. All right, uh, here's one. So as a developer of an application that is not cloud native, are there things I can gain from Jenkins X and Kubernetes? My application is a database, monolithic application that uses the database and another monolithic application. Do I get a benefit from the dev pods and staging environments? Yeah, because you can still do dev pods to do your builds instead of using your local machine. If uh, your um, if you don't use Helm chart, you wouldn't get preview environments today. Um, but you could uh, benefit from the other features like uh, yeah, dev pods is an interesting one. Quick starts. If you want to uh, create uh, new projects uh, quickly, but I guess dev pods and faster builds and serverless builds, if that's something that you want uh, to prevent the management of Jenkins masters and things like that, you could get that because this will build any Jenkins project you want, you have. So it's not just for Jenkins it will build anything that has a Jenkins file. All right, so I think that that leads well into this next question, which was how will Jenkins X merge with the mainstream Jenkins and also how is it different from Argo? So it's not going to merge because Jenkins X uses Jenkins. So it's using, it's, it's another option for people. And in one, as I said, you can still run Jenkins on Jenkins X. So Jenkins X is to be run on Kubernetes today. Um, there's people that need Jenkins running somewhere else, and that's why the Jenkins will still exist. Um, and how it's different from Argo? I'm not uh, in hugely familiar with Argo, but um, Argo is more focused on pipelining and not so much on the continuous delivery part of it. Um, that was the impression I got. Last time I checked, um, and this is Jenkins X is focused on continuous delivery and now trying to get into progressive delivery and canary deployments and things like that and making the life easier for developers. All right, it's a lot of uh, a lot of questions on what Jenkins X will work with. I'm going to kind of sprinkle these throughout. Uh, will Jenkins X work with my on-prem Bitbucket and what permissions will it need? Yes, Jenkins X, I think there's a uh, bit back it will work on the, um, you can check on the website. I don't remember all the providers that work today. Uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, Bitbucket server at least, work, I mean, Bitbucket uh, cloud will work. I don't know if the on-prem, but I think it will too. The only caveat is that only GitHub works with the serverless and that's, that's because all these, uh, webhook um, event handlers uh, today they only work with github but that's something we're trying to change um, but the traditional jenkins on jenkins x would work on on as several uh, git providers all right let's see uh, kubernetes app may have different urls how does jenkins x know which url to put into the pr as a preview So we are working on several assumptions and opinionated uh, 
a structure. So when you build a Helm chart, and this is, I think that this is the, the common practice, you have one chart, one service, one deployment, one service uh, URL. If your Helm chart has multiple ones, and uh, then I haven't tried, but I guess one of them, one of the services or one of the ingresses uh, would uh, take precedence over the other. But the, all the examples and quick starts and all that, you will see is one service with one ingress for that service. Great. Uh, when you say headless Jenkins, are you just referring to Jenkins X? No, so Jenkins X can run with headless Jen uh, with serverless Jenkins and with traditional Jenkins. So those are different things. Uh, Jenkins ser serverless Jenkins or headless Jenkins, if you want to call it like that, it's uh, actually it's a project called Jenkins File Runner. That is what uh, does the Jenkins file execution and as a headless uh, service, let's say. Great. So uh, we're all, we're going to do maybe two more to be respectful of everyone's time. So we're not going to get to all of these. Just so everyone knows, if we didn't get to your question and you needed an answer, just shoot me an email. I will put my email into the chat very soon. Uh, but in the meantime, Carlos, is all configuration for the code and the environments maintained in the same Git repo, or are there additional Git repos for environment configs, etc.? Yeah. So there is one repo for each app you have. And then there is two more repos, one more repo for each environment. So if you have a staging and production, which are the default, you can create more. Uh, you will get two repos, one for staging, one for production. And you can create more environments if you want, if you have more stages in the middle. All right, so seeing a lot of uh, how this works in different environments. So I think I have to take some of these demos offline, make it easier. But uh, let's see, how do you manage security in this model? Helm appears to have monolithic permissions, so you could submit a Helm chart that modifies resources in the cube system, for example. Is there a layer in Jenkins X that ensures users don't have direct access to Helm? Yeah, so the way that this, this is set up, users should don't, well, don't need access to Helm. It would be the builders the ones that are going to deploy things. So if you change your uh, staging or production Git repository, then a builder is going to build that for you and do the Helm deploy. So you don't have to do anything and you don't need access to Helm. We are also looking into, and there's some work in progress follow up for the Helm 3 version that is going to be uh, just this refactoring going on to make it um, not needing Tyler running on the serve, on the Kubernetes cluster all the time and with elevated permissions and so on. But right now, is users don't need to do Helm installs. This is all done by the builder. All right. There's a lot more questions still coming in, but we are at the top of the hour. So what I'm going to do, just so everyone knows, is take these questions offline and see if maybe we can get some sort of documentation or a blog post together for everything. In the meantime, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. As I mentioned before, my email is in the chat if you want to get in touch and get an answer sooner. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for the presentation. Is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? No, thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope All this right. has been helpful. Uh, yeah, we, we do have a lot of questions. I, I do think. Uh, I do think that overall people are interested. So like I said, I'm about to close this out. There's a quick little survey about what you want to hear more about. Uh, let us know if you didn't already ask a question. We'll talk to you again real soon.